About a year ago, the uranium stocks became so strong that they began to outpace the strength in uranium. Um, just any any companies you could see any junior investors getting involved in would be greatly appreciated. Look back over the last 40 years, most management teams have been almost singularly unsuccessful. I'm not trying to say that some of them haven't jittied a 25 cent stock to a buck and a quarter, mm -hmm. but they haven't built anything of any lasting value. Hi, I'm Montana York, your host here at Cambridge House, and I'm joined today by the one and only Rick Rule, CEO and founder of Sprott Global Resource Investments. Rick, thank you for being here. Montana, pleasure being with you. Thank you. Um, Rick, what is catching your eye on the market right now? You know, the market, at least in the very near term, looks very strong to me. Uh, in particular, uh, it had been my view that with the U.S. Fed at least jawboning up interest rates, talking about reducing the taper, that the increase in interest rates, particularly around the U.S. 10-year Treasury, would strengthen the dollar and weaken gold. Turns out, as usual, I was half right. Uh, the dollar has, in fact, been very strong against other currencies, but gold has been strong too. Mm -hmm. There have not been many circumstances in my career where both gold and the dollar have risen simultaneously. But when that has happened, particularly when it's happened uh, against a bullish backdrop for gold, which I believe we have, the gold market has responded uh, very well. So in the very, in the very near term, uh, obviously, the strength in the gold market, where I thought in the very near term, the gold market was going to be weak, has been attractive. It's more attractive to me because the equities haven't followed suit, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say, if the underlying commodity goes up, the earnings around the companies that produce those commodities will go up and their share prices will go up. To see the relative strength, at least in the gold market, without uh, a follow through occurring in the gold equities market which was already relatively attractive, uh, means that the sector has become even more attractive to me. The second sector I think that's particularly appealing to me as a speculator is the uranium space. Okay. Uh, I have a long history in the uranium business, even a long history in uranium around Cambridge, probably going back to, I'm guessing, before you were born. <laughs> Uh, but the uranium business has treated me very, very, very well. And, and I have been for three years uh, eager to establish new positions in uranium. About a year ago, the uranium stocks became so strong that they began to outpace the strength in uranium. A couple things have changed. Uh, one, my former employer, uh, Sprott Inc. launched the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, which has done a spectacular job of gobbling up the surplus supplies in the spot market. At the same time that uh, new ESG considerations around carbon uh, has made nuclear power much more politically palatable than it's been in the past, but particularly in Japan. And uh, Japan, uh, the Fukushima disaster was sort of the author of the current uh, malaise and uranium prices. And to see widespread political support in Japan for reopening their nuclear fleet gives a uh, near-term impetus to the uranium price. And this newfound timeliness and newfound imp uh, uh, impetus has been greeted by a uranium equities market that's off roughly 50% in seven months. So at the same time that the sector is more attractive, uh, the cover charge, the entry has gone down. Uh, and that's sort of combination, uh, I guess, of macro thesis and micro pricing has always attracted me. So I'm very attracted to both places. Uh, finally, a fob to Canada. Um, the Canadian oil and gas stocks have had a hell of a run, a tremendous run, but they're still priced uh, as though uh, oil was at 60 US dollars for West Texas Intermediate. And they're still priced as though uh, gas uh, at the Alberta hub was at $3. And the prices are more like 90 and 5, respectively. If we hold any prices anywhere near this, uh, the Canadian oil and gas stocks are still cheap. The easy money has been made. Don't get me wrong. The sector's up 150% in 18 months. But if we hold prices above 70 U.S., uh, it has been estimated by Eric Nuttall, a very good buy side analyst in Canada, that the uh, Canadian oil and gas index could take itself private. That is to say, retire all its shares and retire all its debt in five years. Uh, and given that the median reserve life index in Canada is 15 years, uh, 
buying 15 years of uh, production for five years in free cash flow still seems like a bargain to me. So I'm fairly bullish about my sector right now. Amazing. So it's safe to say you are deploying capital. I am deploying capital. Okay. I am deploying capital. I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm usually early. So uh, despite the fact, as an example, that the uranium stocks are substantially less expensive than they were six months ago, it doesn't mean they can't go down a little bit. But when I juxtapose the downside to the upside, the upsides are so much larger than the downsides and the probabilities around the upsides are greater. Uh, it's a wonderful time to be a speculator. Good. Awesome. Thank you so much. Do you mind uh, letting my listeners take a peek inside your current portfolio? Uh, depending on how, how close <laughs> peak they want, you know, try me, uh, you know. Um, just any, any companies you could see any junior investors getting involved in would be greatly appreciated. Well, junior investors, I need to say that my portfolio right now is probably 75% investment, 25% speculation. Okay. Because at present, uh, in the resource space, the bigger companies offer better price to value ratios than the smaller companies do. Uh, I traditionally have been known as a small cap and micro cap investor, but I note that the uh, major mining and oil and gas companies are trading on metrics that are only slightly less advantageous than the best of the juniors, and they have a lot less risk. So right now, my portfolio is probably 75% dominated uh, by bigger companies. And even some of the companies that I regard as speculative might be regarded by some of your Vancouver-based audience as ludicrously conservative, Right. Uh, which is to say, you know, I've been buying things like Osisco Royalty. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, the market capitalization is pretty easily explained uh, by cash and securities uh, and, and part of either the Eleanor or the uh, Detour uh, royalty. Um, Endeavor Mining, uh, another company that many people wouldn't regard as speculative, but I, I think it's ludicrously cheap. I Think, however, on the more speculative part of the spectrum that I'm leaning more towards the exploration stocks. What's worked in Canadian speculative markets for the last 15 years has been you know, development stage projects or advanced exploration projects. Uh, people haven't paid much attention to greenfields exploration, but the money is going to begin to cascade from the seniors all the way down to generative and grassroots exploration. And I think the part of the Canadian market that will surprise everybody, perhaps myself included nine months from now, are the exploration juniors. And the consequence of that is that I am beginning to deploy into the better of the early stage employer, uh, uh, pardon me, explorers. And it's a wonderful time to do it because there's no competition. Uh, I joked uh, with your friend Jay that, <laughs> Even an old, bald, fat guy like me can win the 50-meter dash if I'm the only guy that shows up to run. Uh, and right now, when I look at the Greenfields Explorers, uh, you know, I'm the only one who cares, which is wonderful. Amazing. Thank you for the tip. Um, Rick, as a widely respected mentor, any other tips or tricks you would offer the junior investors in my audience? Yeah, uh, a few things. Your exhibitors or your advertisers will hate this, but it's important to remember arithmetically that exploration is a lousy business. If you merged every junior, every explorer company, every development company in the world into one company, there's probably 1,500, 2,000 of them. If you made them all one company and called it Junior Explore Co., that company in a good year would lose $2 billion. In a bad year, it would lose $10 billion. Uh, so, Montana, what do you think that company's worth? Is it worth five times losses, seven times losses, 12 times losses? The point is that you need to be very picky. 5% of the issuers generate so much utility that they offer credibility and sometimes even luster to a sector that loses $2 billion a year. I would suggest that if there are 2,000 issuers out there, that there are no more than 350 that are worth considering. So it's important to be much pickier. Than people believe. The second thing is that you don't get bargains when everybody's looking for them. You have to be in a sector that nobody wants. Uh, you have to be unpopular to make real money. 
The third thing that I would tell uh, your listeners is that people matter much more than properties if you're looking for profits. Mm-hmm. The joys of alliteration, PP and P. If you uh, look back over the last 40 years, most management teams have been almost singularly unsuccessful. I'm not trying to say that some of them haven't jittied a 25 cent stock to a buck and a quarter, mm-hmm. but they haven't built anything of any lasting value. On the other hand, there are 15 or 20 management teams that have been serially successful. And hanging out with the serially successful people and ignoring everybody else is a much better use of time and money than, you know, sort of flitting around from fad to fad to fad. You know, you, you find some really charming salespeople in Vancouver. They've uh, failed in gold. They failed in marijuana. They have failed in crypto. They're about to fail in carbon. Uh, and, and then you find some other people who are really good at what they do, and they've been serially successful. And it doesn't take much common sense to figure out you ought to hang out with the good people and you ought to avoid the bad people. But most people don't do that. And the final thing I would say is that the eighth wonder of the world, but the first wonder of investing is compounding and compounding takes time. I remember, I sort of remember when I was your age, it was a long time ago, but I do remember that I wanted my investments to pay quickly, which is odd because I had a lot of time left on earth. (laughs) I find younger people sometimes have trauma holding stock over a long weekend. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because they haven't done enough job, uh, enough of a job studying the stocks. In other words, they don't have faith. But what I found, uh, at at least in terms of a search for 10 baggers, which is why one speculates, uh, both the mean and the median holdings for me of companies that have generated 10 to 1 returns or 20 to 1 returns or 30 to 1 returns has been five years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And interestingly, uh, in most of the multi-baggers that I've enjoyed at some period of time during the time I held it, the five years, the stock has declined by 50%. And so you have to have both patience and tenacity to make money uh, as a speculator. Uh, It's odd that when I was young and had much more time on earth, I was much less patient. And now that I'm 69, I guess at age 69, you've gone through so many five-year periods that five years doesn't seem daunting to you anymore. But I've become infinitely more patient now that I have less time on earth, which is sort of ironic, but it has improved my investment performance a lot. Amazing. Thank you so much for the advice, Rick. Pleasure. Um, If my audience was looking for more advice like that, where would they find you? God, you're really good at this. You know, you're going far. <laughs> uh, I love talking to older and younger audiences. And in, as an incentive to get them to do that, if your audience would like to talk to me about natural resources, particularly their natural resources, go to a website, rick at ruleinvestmentmedia.com. No, I'm sorry. That's not where you go. <laughs> but you can go there too. You can find me there. But if you <laughs> care about what I think about your portfolio, go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com. You can enter your natural resource stocks there. Please no crypto. Please no tech stocks. I'll rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And I'll comment individually if I uh, think that my comments might have value. In addition, uh, for any of your older or younger listeners who are accredited, who want to participate in private placements, I have a free service. Uh, free so far anyway, <laughs> where I disclose before I put money into a private placement. Anybody who cares what I do with my private placement money, if they're accredited, can write placements in the question line uh, underneath the stock rankings. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there uh, with one final thing. We talked a bit about uranium. March 19th, uh, I'm doing a uranium boot camp. So anybody who cares about the uranium boot camp, it'll be eight online hours, uh, 99 US dollars, complete money back guarantee. If you attend the boot camp and you don't think you got your money back, email me and I'll give you your money back. Um, we're going to have nine issuers, including the biggest uranium company in the world, because Adam Prom, the big Canadian company, Cameco, China General Nuclear. Uh, it's going to be an absolutely great masterclass in uranium speculation. Uh, confident enough that there's a 100% money back guarantee. If you care about the boot camp, when you go to the rankings web cut website, simply write boot camp in the questions line and we'll send you information. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rick. Always a pleasure, Montana. Thank you.